the race aircraft. Gentlemen, you're looking good. Gentlemen, you have a race. Racing, it's in our DNA as humans. We were born with the desire to be the fastest, the front runner, the first to cross the finish line. Our ancestors raced. They raced on foot, on horseback, in chariots, and later with automobiles, and yachts, and best of all, airplanes. Airplanes like this one. We race, and we come to watch races because we love competition. And that's what Reno and the National Championship Air Races are all about. It strikes this chord in our innermost human nature. Air racing gives us a visceral excitement like no other. You feel it the moment you enter the gate at Stead Field, hearing the throb of the big Merlin and Wright and Pratt and Whitney engines, that sound rolling like thunder across the desert. You feel it beating on your skin. And having felt that, air racing is in your blood forever. Now, the outside observer would ask, why? Why do they put these irreplaceable vintage airplanes, like this one, at risk? Why would pilots flying in close proximity to each other and to the ground put themselves at risk? And more to the point, what is it about air racing that draws them and us to the high desert every autumn? The answer is, quite simply, it's the greatest aviation spectacle on Earth. There's nothing like it. And make no mistake, this is aerial combat without guns or missiles, the victor being the pilot who flies the fastest, cleanest line around the course. Air racing is not a sport for the faint-hearted. The outcome, victory or defeat, hinges on skill, courage, and fortune. This is high-stakes drama. This is the challenge that has drawn intrepid airmen and legendary airplanes to Reno for nearly half a century. And it's what brings us back here every September to watch history being made. We got together and Bill said, hey, you guys, I'm going to start uh, uh, air racing in Reno. I said, well, that's great. Are you going to come and see you? And he looked at me and said, would you like to fly f 8 I said, what is the f 8 I never have seen one. Obviously, there was a lot of preparation flying-wise. I had to have experience. You know, Tiger wasn't going to let me fly his airplane without having any Mustang time. Uh, so instead of going out on Friday nights or going to you know proms or whatever, I was always go putting money into flying. He said. Would you like to come and work for me? And I said, well, what will I be flying? And he said, uh, I can't tell you. I said, when do I start? <laughs> I need to go back and race. I've already done what I wanted to do. I didn't see that any of the guys that had won 
multiple championships, I didn't see that their life was any happier than mine. So, you know, I was content to just move on and do other things. had the water boiling oil cooling system and the water boiling cooling system to cool the coolant. And what we did was we boiled a 50% mixture of pure water and methanol. I got my first airplane ride in a staggered wing beach. I was either seven or eight. And boy, immediately I knew what I wanted to uh, do in life, and that was be a pilot. He had a brand new engine, beautiful engine. We got a propeller from somebody else, you know, and then we built the whole thing. And, uh, and that was a, an amazing project, you know, uh, because the end result was to race it, but the journey was building it. So you've seen uh, everybody on the screen. Please welcome uh, these great pilots. And <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us. Um, and welcome to the Chasing Reno Gold event here at the Plains of Fame Museum. I'm Mark Cholis, the producer of the Chasing Reno Gold video and a videographer out at the air races for on and off the last uh, 20 plus years. So uh, it's uh, a lot of fun and it's great to be here uh, talking with everybody as part of this. Many of you already know each and every one of the panelists and you've just seen all of their short bios uh, on the screen. So I want to kind of jump right in and uh, get started with the program. Over the next two hours, the plan is to get to know each of these winners much better, understand what drove them into aviation and into racing, and what continues to drive them today. I uh, want to find out you know, what they believe the future holds for unlimited air racing uh, as well. If there are areas of interest to you uh, that we don't cover during the event, uh, the idea is to allow a few minutes for audience Q&A at, uh, at the end of the program and give you an opportunity to uh, ask a question or two. If you're not familiar with the Chasing Reno Gold video, it's four hours of interviews with every living unlimited gold winner and some other greats that have helped them to win over the past 50 years. The project came about following the tragic crash in 2011, uh, where the races were cut short that year. I realized that no one had sat down uh, with every living unlimited gold winner and talked to them about how they got their start in aviation, uh, what drove them, what was the passion behind you know, their racing uh, career, and what they really wanted to do. So over the next six months, I contacted all of the winners and the key team members and worked with them and their very busy calendars to schedule a time to sit down for a couple of hours and really document that part of their life. When I started this project, I had no idea whether I would get everyone to do this and what the actual end result would be uh, when it was complete. I had no idea that it would take me all over California, as well as a few other states, um, before all of this was actually completed. Um, if you want to see the entire video, it is playing in the theater here at Plains of Fame for the rest of the day today. Feel free to wander in uh, after taking a look at uh, all the great planes here. And you can also uh, get a copy in the gift shop if you uh, want to take it with you for a, uh, a reasonable price. 
Um, unfortunately, today, uh, Myra Slovak is unable to join us. Um, Myra won the very first unlimited gold in 1964, uh, and we can talk about uh, a little bit of what he did uh, as part of the panel today. Appreciate the uh, Plains of Fame Museum hosting this event. Uh, always enjoy coming over here to spend time. Uh, this is a very special place. There are very few flying museums like this where what you see here uh, within the museum grounds actually goes up. And you'll see a lot of that uh, at the, uh, the May event as well as everything they do uh, here the first Saturday of each month. Uh, if you're not a member, um, please join. You can do that in the gift shop uh, following this event. Very special thanks to Harry Nyer, the Director of Marketing here. Thank you, Harry. Um, Harry put all of this together, and a very, again, special thanks to all of our guests. So, one bit of trivia before we jump into the questions. Just in case you were wondering, there have only been a total of 19 unique unlimited gold winners over the course of those 50 years, Reno to date. So please welcome this distinguished group of aviators, and I want to jump right in uh, with the first question to Mr. Daryl Greenemeyer. Um, Daryl, I want to start at the beginning, and unfortunately, Myra, you know, was uh, uh, not able to join us uh, today. But you were there right from the beginning, and talk about first year what it was like and you actually had probably the fastest unlimited airplane at the 1964 races but you were actually disqualified from winning because of the unique rules uh, that were in place the first year at sky ranch so talk about sky ranch and talk about you know what the races were like and getting prepped for them in 1964. Well, pardon me. In 1964, uh, I heard they were going to have some air races in Reno and uh, at the Sky Ranch. Well, the Sky Ranch was a dirt runway out in the middle of nowhere and, and pretty short, and uh, all the pilots flew out of. Uh, the Reno Airport downtown, and then would uh, get out to the race course and fly around the course. And uh, then all of a sudden, when the race day came along, uh, in fact, I won the, the first race that I ran in, but then I went back to uh, the Reno Airport to land, but then they said, no, next time you have to land at the, the uh, Sky Ranch. So I made an approach in the Sky Ranch, and uh, it kind of scared me. I wasn't sure I could do it, so I went around and went back to Reno you know, and was eliminated. So the, the runway actually had just kind of been fabricated and extended uh, very recently. I guess so, but there was you know people on both sides of the runway and airplanes scattered around, and uh, I just felt it was not my cup of tea, so I went, accepted the elimination and went back home. <laughs> Clay, you were also there uh, that first year. How about talking a little bit about how you actually heard about racing in Reno because you were actually an airline captain at that time and just happened to be overnight uh, in Reno. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. I, uh, it was in January of 1964. I was up there on a layover and the rain was kind of snowing and I went out and walked around and in the stone I walked by this little building. It was the Chamber of Commerce and they had a, 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 something in the window there about the upcoming air races. So I went in and got one big tan down and uh, went back and I was working with Al Paulson in those days in aircraft sales and things. And uh, next day I said to Al, I said, you know, they're gonna have an air race up in Reno. I said, uh, uh, why don't we get a P-51 and your company sponsor me? He said, you know, I just talked to a guy yesterday that uh, 
wanted to trade a P-51 because we had a 310 there. That wasn't the kind of airplane we sold, but we happened to have one there. And you weren't going to race the 310? What? You weren't going to race the 310? No, and, uh, and we wanted to sell that thing. So anyway, I said there's a guy up in the Lewis in Idaho that uh, wants that 310. He's got a P-51. Uh, he said, I'll call him. So he picks up the phone, calls the guy. And he said, uh, look, if you get that P-51 down here and bring $10,000, you're going to have the success of 310. <laughs> and so he did. And uh, it was a, so we figured we got it for 7500 bucks. It sounds like a real good deal. And it was a good airplane, too. It had both time engine, and it had really good maintenance. It had been an active airplane. Uh, it was a Canadian Air Force airplane, and... Uh, then uh, North America bought it from the Canadians and was using it on some kind of a test program. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's how I found out about the Reno races. And, and you still own that airplane today, correct? Yeah, I guess I'm the, they tell me I'm the longest owner of a B-51, uh, <laughs> so still have it. Thanks. And, and you did actually, you had that arena last year. It was up yeah. on uh, static display. So, turning to, uh, to this side of the panel, Steve, uh, as president of the Plains and Fame Museum, again, I want to thank you for you know hosting this event. Um, uh, I'm just ecstatic to be up here. So, um, with two unlimited golds under your belt and leading the unlimited um, down the uh, the chute. Uh, as part of your duties uh, over the last many years, you've kind of got a very unique insight into racing, into the pilots, into, uh, into the crew. Kind of give us your favorite moment from one of the wins, and then you know, we can talk about you know, what it's like to, uh, to, to lead them up and let them go down the chute. Favorite moment of one of the wins. Well, you know, wins are not easy. Although uh, the first real uh, racer that I flew with the Red Baron, obviously Daryl Greenemeyer. You heard of him? He's here somewhere. He uh, flew the Red Baron and in, uh, in, into a record speed of 430 miles an hour, and then he retired. Thank you, Daryl. <laughs> um, I was a member of the Red Baron race team at the time, and I was uh, ferrying the airplane around from time to time. So. Um, I uh, was selected by Ed Brown and the owner and the, and the crew to be the race, race pilot. So, uh, you know, that, that win in Reno that year in 1978 for me was a big, obviously a, a quite an exciting time. You know, to fly such a, an awesome airplane and uh, be a part of the crew for a lot of years. Probably the best win, though, I've had two. But the best win was the Super Corsair. Throughout a, a one-year period, we uh, here at the museum, uh, Ed Maloney and uh, all the guys pitched in. Uh, we had uh, Pete Law and Bruce Boland and a and, uh, hundred other workers. Uh, we built a Corsair from uh, just a backyard uh, empty shell to a flying airplane <coughs> in less than a year um, uh, with a modification of that R4360, uh, 4,000 horsepower radial engine on it. Um, that was uh, 1987. Is that right? No, no, I'm sorry. What am I thinking? It was 82, I guess it was. Sorry. <laughs> All the years. Um, and uh, for a couple of years, you know, we, we spent, uh, you know, uh, learning how to uh, develop an airplane like that. It took a little while. But in 1985 is when uh, we crossed the finish line second behind Dreadnought Corsair, but uh, because of a pylon cut, we finished first position and um, even though we crossed the finish line second we had set a course record we got around the race course faster than any Mustang had even ever gone so uh, that was probably the, the best win you know like I mentioned on the screen a while ago racing in the wind is something but the journey is uh, you know is, is amazing and uh, with, with that that's probably the best personal win um, but I got a lot of great memories you know leading the the group around, uh, joining up, and seeing the sights of all the racers and all my friends out there, and then uh, of course the last five years seeing my my son do it. It was pretty pretty amazing. So, uh, been 
very lucky. It's a it's a good journey, and I hope it continues for another 50 years. So, Pete Long. So Pete, while not being an actual pilot in the seat racer, uh, you've done a lot to really contribute over the years to make the race teams go faster and to win. How did you first hear about Reno, and what knowledge were you able to, you know, kind of transition from your work at uh, uh, at the Skunk Works to a little bit of racing here in Reno? And before we do that, you know, let's talk about you are still involved in, in R&D today, so the moniker of Secret Pete really still applies, correct? Yes. I uh, work still, believe it or not, after retiring from Lockheed after 43 years. I uh, am doing consulting work for Northrop on the X-47B, which is an unmanned airplane, stealthy airplane that uh, takes on and off carriers completely autonomously. So I have kept up with my engineering. But as far as my beginnings with Daryl Greenmeyer, it's a very interesting story. Daryl will have to wave at me if I'm not correct, but Daryl started in 1964. <laughs> and after the 1964 Reno Air Races, Daryl came into Ben Rich's office. And Ben Rich was the head of flight sciences at that particular time and was Kelly's, effectively, was Kelly's assistant. And he came in to see Ben Rich, and he mentioned to Ben that he wanted to do some oil cooling by doing some boiling, like they did in the air conditioning system of the F-104. They used a water boiler system to help cool the environmental control system when you go up at around uh, Mach uh, 1.8 to Mach 2.2. The, uh, they have nine minutes of water available in this little heat exchanger that they use for doing the air conditioning system, invented a lot of it by Irv Austin sitting right up here in front of Air Research. He's the one that effectively taught me all about how to make that stuff all work. So Ben said, well, I'm no perfect person, and he brings Daryl into the office that I was in, and he introduces me to Daryl and tells me what he wants to do. And I said, well, you know, Daryl, I'd love to do that, but I don't know very much about Second World War airplanes. But I called up who worked downstairs, Bruce Bowman. Now, this was back in 64. And it was after Reno. I don't remember whether it was October or November. So this was after the first race in '64. Right. You wanted to, get, you knew you wanted to go faster after that. So well, I, I can't remember whether it was late September or early October, but I know it was pretty soon after Reno because Daryl wanted to do some things and he needed the time to be able to do them. So I happened to know Bruce. So I said, "Well, I know somebody who's a really good structures guy and aerodynamics guy, and he knows everything you, he could ever want to know about." Second World War airplane, so I called up Bruce. So Bruce came up, I introduced him to Daryl, and I think that Bruce and I from that moment on were doing engineering work with Daryl on all of his different projects in the F-104, and, and of course we did the work on the Red Baron, and Daryl got to fly the Red Baron and win Reno in 78. Was it 78 or 77? 77, you won in 78. Anyway, the engineering part of that was was very interesting to me because I've been doing the kind of work that he wanted me to do on the F-104 through people at Air Research. So I had a whole lot of people to be able to help me do all these things and help these guys go faster. And of course, it ended up where a few years ago at Reno, there were four airplanes that had the water boiling oil cooling system that uh, you know, I worked on for several airplanes before. If you, if you see some of these airplanes up in the movie spewing a little steam out at weird places, you will know that the, uh, the what's going overboard is a vapor of water and methanol, which has cooled the oil and boiled and, and kept the oil at less than 90 degrees centigrade, which is what they need for oil temperatures. Plus, I have done carburetors and water injection systems and radiator spray bars and a whole lot of other interesting things, but it all started with Daryl and Ben Rich. So, uh, I'm going to ask you to do one thing before you pass the mic to Bruce. Will you stand up and turn around and let everybody see your shirt? Because this is uh, back from Daryl's uh, original uh, uh, flight with this the, is, uh, the Conquest. Talk about that. Well, this particular shirt was one of the shirts that we wore back in the old days. and It's been in my closet for quite a few years. And I 
thought that since I was, it was going to be an air race thing and Daryl was going to be here, I'd give a little uh, publicity for the fact that I was able to have the privilege as a young engineer to work with Daryl on some, something as large as going to break a German speed record. And if, as a young engineer, you couldn't ask for anything better to be able to do. And this whole thing has been a, a, a so I'm like a kid in a candy shop when it comes to doing engineering because I love engineering. And these airplanes are the best thing that you could ever have to be doing engineering on. Perfect. Bruce, so you actually started out racing on two wheels. And you kind of, you were also flying at the time, but you weren't racing. So talk about the transition from racing motorcycles to racing airplanes. And you also started crewing uh, before you actually climbed into uh, the pilot seat. Uh, that's correct. And uh, racing motorcycles versus uh, racing airplanes. Well, first, Bob Gantt so elegantly put in his uh, little introduction up there was uh, it's in our genes to do. You know, and I think the thing that's interesting is there's many forms of competition, and you have the average competition having a cup of coffee and playing a game of chess. As racers, though, we look at the advantages we can gain on playing that game of chess. You know, we move the chess board around so the sunlight's in the component of the opponent's eyes and maybe change the color of the, of the chess players and stuff so they don't quite look like the red and black or black and white, so we try to get an edge on them. The transition, the transition from motorcycle racing to air racing, the two have the same, you know, mental concept in that, you know, you're out there and you're wanting to basically tell the guy, look, I'm going to kick your rear end. It's not like a, uh, you know, a friendly game. You're really out there and it gives you the adrenaline rush of doing that. Going to airplanes, main difference was is you really realize your mortality. You know, with motorcycle racing, you know, you, 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 there's always a chance you're going to get hurt and it never really is in the forefront of your mind. It's the same mental aspects go to both sports in that you're there's lines changing around the course, you're competing with a, another uh, rider or, or pilot, so there's always that chess game going on in your mind. But uh, for me, I felt the biggest difference uh, was just that you realized your mortality more in the airplane, you lost more friends doing it, or you, you, know, you, you tried not to take as many chances as you did motorcycle racing. And for me, the adrenaline level was about the same in both sports, I think. Air racing tended to be more of a mental sport than motorcycle racing was. Motorcycle was more physical. So at the end of the day, you're exhausted from either sport that you did. And you actually, how did you first get into uh, to Reno? Was that through an introduction um, with somebody else on the crew or somebody through uh, motorcycle racing? Well, actually, my, my first times at Reno were as a spectator were all the gentlemen to my left were my heroes. You know, I went there and kind of just hung out at the fence with my fingers through the fence watching, as, as many of you do, and spectating, wondering how I could ever get to the other we, side of the fence. We still do that. <laughs> and uh, um, the, my first time racing an airplane, actually, I went raced and crewed. I went with Alan Preston. I had a Corsair that I had purchased in, uh, in Alaska, and I sold it to Alan, ended up flying it to Texas, and ended up going to work with him down in his uh, development company down there in the early 80s. And he decided he wanted to come out and race airplanes at Reno. He was never comfortable flying the Corsair around, and uh, not that he wasn't a great pilot, he just never seemed to suit him right. He liked the Mustang better. So I ended up taking the Corsair out to Reno and qualified it in 85. So. Uh, and then down the start chute on my first seat race, we had the canopy imploded, so it was my first mayday. It was also my first race. So that was a lot of fun. Yeah, probably not a, uh, a real good introduction to, uh, to the sport. So, thank you. Steve-O, I didn't forget about you over there. So, as the, um, the, the youngest unlimited gold winner, which is a, a title you stole from your father, uh, who had, had held that for many years as well. So, um, uh, that's a good heritage. Yeah, that's not an issue. So you're probably one of the most well-rounded members of the, uh, the racing pilot community because you 
really do work start to finish on the airplanes. Um, in fact, just before you came in here, I think you were out working on something. And I know that you've been going back and forth to, to work on you know, the, the other airplane that you fly. Talk a little bit about, you know, did you know from an early age growing up here at the airport that that's what you wanted to do? Did you want to race? Did you want to, to fly? And did you, you know, did you always start working on planes at a very early age? Uh, the first time I attended their air races, I was two weeks old. <laughs> I didn't see the airplanes much. I was more focused on cheese and crackers. <laughs> with toys, but uh, I was there the first time that I recognized uh, that I wanted to race uh, uh, was I, I was 15 years old and I remember I was up with my dad on the T-33 I was up there for a week and out of school and put in the windshield and uh, walking down the start of the unlimited gold race on Sunday, walking down the line and seeing the aircraft uh, and then I fell in love with Stray uh, to me the lines of the Mustang are hard to beat and a you know, smooth wing it was just beautiful and at that point thought, I need to get on a crew, how do I do that? And that's when I, so 15 is when I first uh, decided that air racing was something I wanted to do. Although, uh, I was always around airplanes, and from a young age I knew I wanted to fly. I didn't know where that was gonna take me, but at 15 was when I decided air racing was something I wanted to do. And, and you didn't actually jump right into uh, to Strega the first time that you raced at, at Reno. You had, to, you had to pay a few dues. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the first airplane that I took around the race course was Lady Joe, and uh, I got to qualify at Daryl Bond's owner of that airplane, and it was uh, uh, Robbie Patterson was the pilot of it at the time, which was great because I got to out-qualify him, and, uh, and then I got to go around the race course in uh, Sparky that year for a couple of heat races, and that was kind of where I uh, got my first fight in air racing, and uh, it was a great experience learning uh, how uh, the operations work up there, procedures. Uh, but I remember my first race in Sparky, uh, CJ Stevens lapped me in Argonaut, and it, it made a heck of a noise going over my head. And uh, seeing the sea period disappear in front of me, I thought, I never want to be in this position again. This sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I haven't been back in that position yet. But uh, I started out as a crew member with Strega. I was uh, 16 or 17 years old. So I've been around the air races for a few years, seriously, before I started racing Sparky. Perfect. Clay, um, we talked about you know the fact that you still own Miss Van Nuys today, which is the, the P51. Um, I, I'm going to go off on a, a two-part question here with you. Um, talk about the excitement climbing into that plane for the first time, and do you still feel that today? Because you you still fly it once in a while. And then talk about it's it's got a very unique paint scheme on it. Talk about how that came about. So, how does it feel climbing into that today? And is it still as exciting as the first time? Well, I mean, P 51 is a nice airplane to fly, no doubt about it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, uh, we bought it originally for $7,500, and so it would probably depreciated. And I, I figure you can't afford to sell it. So I, <laughs> Anyway, um, uh, the paint job is an interesting thing. My, my friend Al, Alan Paulson, uh, he had a company at the time, uh, California Automotive Company, he later owned Gulfstream Aerospace. But he um, had repoed three constellations, uh, old 749s, and, and uh, Fish Salmon, who was an uh, ex race guy in the 40s, late 40s, the Lockheed uh, pilot, chief engineering test pilot. Um, he and um, uh, Dale Robertson, an um, actor, movie actor, they wanted to run the airline. I think they saw some pretty lucky flight attendants on it. They decided we want to run this airline. So Al said, Oh, okay, you know, you know things are simpler than with the FAA. So they started. Uh, they were going to uh, fly the airline, so uh, they, uh, Paulson's wife said, well, let's call it the Orchid Fly to Hawaii, and uh, so uh, paint a stripe on it, Orchid color. So he told the purchasing agent to buy 50 gallons of paint to 
but just the stripes along the windows on three airplanes. And then he got about 15 other gallons. And so uh, he was painting tugs and ladders and everything purple. So when we got the P-51, one day he says to me, have you thought about what color you want to paint it? And I said, no, actually I haven't. He said, good. He said, we'll paint it purple. And he said, uh, he said, people will love it. They'll think it's a purple people eater. And, uh, so uh, many years later, uh, and, uh, well, I'd say right about 1970, uh, one of my social pit crew members was um, Rick Runyon, and he was a design type guy. And Fred Smith uh, hired him to uh, design the image for Federal Express. And uh, he asked Smith uh, what color he wanted, and he said, I don't care, just something people remember. So he thought, well, man, that, guy, that purple, uh, he could do what people remember, and he said, uh, so he uh, made the first paint scheme on the trucks on everything purple. And so what that's how purple it? people are, I mean, uh, FedEx got to be purple. Was that still part of the 1,500 gallons uh, that were left over? Or? No, I don't think so by then. <laughs> Daryl, we, we touched a little bit about uh, your involvement with Pete Law and the Skunk Works. So, you actually started out as a test pilot at Area 51, flying the A-12, among others. Um, and, and, you know, the video introduction kind of talked a little bit about, you know, how you went to work for them. And, and that's a great story about, you know, doing the interview and, you know, not even knowing what you were going to fly. So, can I ask you to talk a little bit about, you know, the interview before you went to work uh, for the Scuff Works, and then let's talk about the transition of going from Mach 3 to, you know, flying Conquest. It's all classified, I'm sorry. <laughs> Flying the, uh, the A-12 and the SR-71 were uh, very exciting, except in the airplane just uh, is built to fly at high altitude and high speed, and the name of the program is get to high altitude and high speed with as much fuel as you can because you can go further. It takes uh, actually 58 minutes to fly from Palmdale to Florida. <laughs> And people say, how do you know? And doesn't it depend on the wind? Well, there's no wind above 50,000 feet. Uh, I remember one time I was, uh, we had an airplane down at Eglin Air Force Base that was going through uh, what they called a coal hanger. Now, why they put a coal hanger at Eglin, I'll never understand. You could park it outside in, Mon in Montana and get the coal if you want, but it was down there for uh, test purposes uh, in the coal hangar, and then when it was finished, they sent me down to bring it back, and I had to fly it back to Sonic. And I remember uh, I made a local flight with it to Sonic, and then landed. And, uh, there was a squadron of um, F4 pilots that would, we'd meet in the bar at night and talk about it and they said, boy, that airplane is a real slug, it takes all the runway to get airborne. And I said, yeah, but it goes fast once you get up there. And so at any rate, uh, the conversation went around and I said, look, I'll, uh, I'll bet you I'll buy a round for all you guys if you don't hear a shock wave in about 30 minutes or whatever it was, because I had gone outside and called Palmdale and find out that uh, Bob Gilliland was flying an airplane down, and I knew that it, it, it took 58 minutes, and, and so I think I missed it by three minutes. There was a shockwave, and uh, he overflew Eglin, and so I got drinks the rest of the night. <laughs> How was it to go from flying, you know, Mach 3 to going around the, the closed course at 370 or 380 miles an hour? Um, you know, going from a jet to uh, the, the, you know, ground engine. Of course, I didn't work on the jet. I, the 
round engine took a lot of work and tuning and uh, but flying the course uh, I remember when I first went to work for Lockheed I worked for Tony LaPierre who had air raced at Cleveland uh, after the war and uh, he said the best thing you can do is fly a smooth course don't fly up to the pylon and make a hard turn kind of flow around the course. And he said, uh, probably three G's would do it. And so that's what I learned to do, is to fly low and try and uh, sweep the course instead of yank and bang. And it, it seemed to work. But uh, I have to say that, uh, you know, I, I'm just really the bus driver. The guys that put the airplane together and helped me get it flying are the ones that uh, really are responsible for the airplane going fast. And if you can't go fast, you can't win. And so I just got up there and cruised around, or tried to. <laughs> kind of almost like the uh, the, the SR-71, but uh, I don't think you were pulling three Gs in that, were you? No. <laughs> uh, well, if you've got a moment, I'll tell you about one thing. Uh, I went on a test flight early on in the A-12, and uh, we had a stability augmentation system that you turned on on the right hand. It was uh, pitch, yaw, and roll. And uh, they wanted me to go on a test to some altitude in uh, Mach 3 and turn the stability augmentation system off and pull uh, about one and a half Gs and turn loose of it. Well, I got to about 1.1 Gs, and the airplane started pitching up, and I hit the instrument panel so hard that, and they uh, recorded the force, uh, of, and they couldn't believe that I pushed it that hard to get it down. But it was going to pitch up if I didn't push it down. So, with this, with the SAS or stability augmentation system working, it worked fine. So. Not a whole lot of manual flying on the, on that one. Manual flying on the, on that one. We didn't have an autopilot on the early days, and our navigation was ADF. I could pick up uh, Los Angeles uh, 640 from practically the Canadian border. <laughs> <laughs> so Pete, much of your work has been done on the World War II racers, the Mustangs, the Bearcats, the Sea Furies, and you also worked on Jack Sandberg's Tsunami and on the Pond Racer, correct? Yes. So, both of those were purpose-built for racing. Um, unfortunately, neither, neither of those really achieved the design goals. But talk about some of the developments that you brought to each of those what did you learn from that? Where did you see the future going in that area? Well, I worked on so many airplanes that people ask me to always make that airplane, Bruce and I always make that airplane faster than the one before. So when we worked on Daryl's airplane, the next guys to come along said, well, we want to go faster than that airplane. And eventually we were doing Candace and we were doing the Red Baron D-51 and then we were doing Strega and Dago Red and and eventually tsunami for John. But each of the things that I worked on mainly had to do with cooling. Either water boiling oil cooling systems or spray bars for the radiators. Also did carburetors, water injection systems, all of these things. I remember in 1969, Daryl told me, he says, I'm gonna take you down to Aircraft Carburetor Company and introduce you to the guy that does my carburetors and my water injection systems. And I want you to learn everything you can from him, because if I don't get up, if we if we can't get other airplanes that go as fast as mine, air racing is going to die because nobody wants to see the same airplane win every single year. So he said, I want you and Bruce to go out and help other people go fast, and I want you to learn how to do water injection systems so that some of these P51s that keep blowing up because they don't know how to do water injection properly or they're not cooled properly. So he took me and introduced me to Al Gamaro of Aircraft Carburetor Company, and from then on I was overhauling his water injection systems for him for DC-4s and uh, Convair 440s. 
for like eight years before he finally retired. And I was doing the unlimited hydroplane carburetors with him because he had customers would have him doing the unlimited carburetors for the hydroplanes. And of course, spray bar cooling through Dave Zuschel, he was the one who, who actually said, we've got to spray the water into these things. And so Air, Air Austin at Air Research was giving us clues on how to do that properly. So what I added effectively was engineering for cooling, for fuel system carburation, and for water injection to make the airplanes go faster and not uh, destroy themselves. It's uh, the future of air racing. I, I see if the uh, people at Reno straighten up their uh, attitude with the FAA with respect to uh, where they are forcing the good guys to or not to fly, if, that, if they can get this thing straight, then it will continue on. And if they don't get it straight, nobody's going to want to go out there and take the chance of doing something. But I, I see that uh, it's very hard to build an unlimited racer from scratch. We did Tsunami, Steve flew Tsunami. Uh, Daryl, with Bruce's design, had uh, built uh, partially built Chalkway. Well, there's an effort there with the uh, article, it was just in the last Air, Air Classics, to have somebody be interested enough to help either buy the project or sponsor it. Uh, that airplane is capable with some calculations that have been made of, with the propeller to go 600 miles an hour straight level at 11,000 feet. And it's that airplane can do it because Bruce designed it to do that. Uh, Bruce also designed another airplane that Rod Lewis ends up owning, which was called Spirit of America, that he and Dave Parnell did. If anybody ever text, takes that over um, and gets that going, it's a pretty fast airplane also. But eventually, the people who own these P-51s, and like Clay pointed out, they gone up in value so, so much you can't sell it because of taxes, I assume, for Clay, right? <laughs> but, uh, when these airplanes finally get to their limits, of course we don't know what the limit is, but somebody's going to have to come up and start building airplanes from scratch like Tsunami and Shockwave and Spirit of America. And uh, if somebody does come up with that, of course we're the ones that are doing it and we're getting old. And, and uh, I don't know any young engineers that really want to get into this because of uh, one reason or another. I seem to want to try to find a somebody to mentor to be doing all of this engineering. But you know, it does take a lot of engineering. These airplanes are not as simple as everybody thinks they are. There's a lot of work that has to go into the structures and the flutter and the dynamics. And it's, uh, it, it's something that people are gonna have to get interested enough in to actually go out and spend the money to do it or the, or the older airplanes are gonna get worn out. Well, and I'm guessing today's a and schools aren't really focused on Merlins and Pratt & Whitney's today. They're, you know, you're not seeing a lot of those, you know, being taken apart and put back together. Uh, the young kids today uh, have a disadvantage because there isn't the opportunity to do these sorts of things. Steve, Steve, Stephen over there and Steve Sr. were like Daryl. They worked on the airplanes from time zero, hands-on, just like Bruce and I, we had to actually had to be over all the carburetors on the scene, water injection systems. I changed people's jets right there at the race course, change pressure settings to get more of this or that, do the nitrous oxide occasionally. Of course, we found out we could blow the airplanes up without nitrous oxide, so why, 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 why use it? I, I, I'm going to ask Daryl about a good story about that here in, in, okay. in a second. I'll stop talking. Pete had mentioned the article on Shockwave in the latest Air Classics magazine. So if you're interested, it's a great article with a lot of really good photos. Um, and there will be available a little bit if you want to chat with him after the, uh, the program about that. Um, it's a fascinating airplane and it would be great to actually see uh, something at, at Reno go, you know, 550 or 600 miles an hour, wouldn't it? Well, the, let, me, let me explain that the 600 mile per hour thing is the primary objective of this. Yes, it will make a good race over there. Daryl, I think that the airplane is mainly to go for the 600 mile an hour barrier or not. Oh, whatever, right? Well, we'll, we'll get there. Bruce, uh, 
you won back-to-back -back gold in uh, 98 and in 99 with uh, Dago Red. Um, talk about the, the competitive environment at that time because that really was kind of the, the focal point with Strago, with Rare Bear, and with Dago, um, all really you know, fighting over a, a, a decade-long period. Well, the two uh, venues, probably 99 was the most intense for me. 98, that was my first time really racing a, a full gold unlimited. I'd raced other airplanes previously, but the first time really putting in the driver's seat of an airplane that was capable of winning the gold. Um, 98 was a little easier because Straight was out that year and, and Bob Han and Voodoo was still having teething problems. So basically I just had to you know, take what was a great package, well prepared, and, and just get it around the race course without cutting any pylons or doing any stupid, not putting the right switches on. Um, I ended up, <clears throat> actually it ended up being a fairly competitive race in that if some of you have watched some film footage, you'll see that uh, uh, Dreadnought ends up passing me at about lap four. And what had happened in there, I was, uh, I'd come down to start shoot and from my first race in 85 in the Corsair where I had the, the canopy explode and come off of it. I was aware that those issues are, you know, can happen. So coming down to start shoot, the, can the canopy closure lever on Mustangs on the right side clicked once and the canopy opened about that far. And a couple of years prior, Alan had had the canopy on Dago Red when he was racing, actually go all the way to the back and almost took his head off. So I, about that too, I started to look like a turtle with my head down, paying attention to what the canopy was doing, trying to close it. What I didn't see is that I hadn't tightened the friction stop down fully on the, on the throttle, so my manifold pressure, I think I started at 120 and 3400, the manifold pressure started backing off to about, you know, 100, then 90, then 85 inches, and nobody had, on the crew that was looking at telemetry had caught what was going on, so I'm looking at the canopy, you know, got my head down, trying to get it closed, and all of a sudden, uh, uh, Dreadnought goes thundering by and I'm going, what the hell, you know, I know this thing's faster than that. And I look down and I had 80 inches of manifold pressure. By then, when I came back up on the power, the motor wasn't de-riched, so the plugs had loaded up, so it took about a lap or so before the engine really cleaned out and started to run. And I caught back up with him and then got in some famous uh, Dreadnought weight turbulence and about was, you know, facing pylon one, kind of an inverted position. So after getting all that sorted out, I think that uh, 98 was a, was a fun year. 99, for me, was probably the most exciting win because I really had a full field of guys to contend with. Strager was there, Tiger with all his antics and, you know, and pre-race things that go on and kidding with each other, how much power you're going to run. And uh, Voodoo was, you know, competitive and Rare Bear was there with Matt Jackson. So. Um, the competitive nature and I think the quality of a win is always based on who you have to race against and the amount of uh, you know racing that you're doing. Talk a little you, you kind of touched on the, the competitive nature of Tiger. So going back to that point, you know, Tiger was, was kind of famous for uh, I don't want to say, you know, not telling the truth or, you know, expanding on on things that may or may not be real. Were, were there things going back and forth between the pilots and the crew to kind of jockey for a position? And, and, you know, what were some of those, and, uh, you know, let's call them, who told the, uh, the, the biggest whopper out there? Well, Tiger was probably the best at doing that, although Bob Hannon was very good because he was an ex, you know, a fantastic motorcycle racer, multi-time national champion, and was really good with, with head gains. And, and head gains can be anything with, well, how much power are you running today? Well, how much power are you going to run? You know, we all want to save our motors so that we've got a full, basically a full load for Sunday. So really you only want to, unless you're out setting a record, you only want to win a heat race with the least amount of power you can get away with. So that's predicated on what the guy's going to run behind you. So, you know, we start, well, I'm going to run 32 and 80 down to start. And, and I'm thinking, yeah, right. So I'm going to run 34 and 120, and then find out they'll run 35 and 135 for the start. So it always ends up being kind of fun. With Tiger, he never knew what he was going to do. There was one time he arrived at the races with a pretending he had broken his arm and, you know, and it was funny who could fly the airplane for him and he had a cast on and really just framed it and he took the cast off and ended up racing. 
so he'd go over there and he'd be talking about how the airplane's broken and making metal and you know can't run any power with it and you guys go have a fun race and it's, everything's working perfectly. So that was always fun. Steve, I don't know how much of that you know you can see from your position uh, as the, uh, the the pace start plane. Can you see them jockeying for position uh, at that point uh, before you let them go? Are they still you know kind of adjusting, or are they full full throttle? You know when they when you give them the uh, the release. So being in the pace plane, it is a unique position, and I, um, I kind of know individually, you know, the capabilities of our pilots and kind of know who knows how to fly formation and, and uh, but, but during a race start, there's a lot going on in the cockpit, you know, for one thing, you know, the airplanes are built for racing and not for flying formation and, and uh, coming down the chute and, you know, some of the airplanes are high power setting, some are low power setting, some guys have to adjust their fluids at the coolant doors. In a formation, when someone is bobbling around a little bit, it just makes the formation worse. Then you've got the Liebert factor, where he's always trying to cheat and trying to get a jump on the start. And so you kind of, you know, watch. You kind of know what to expect after after doing this a while and flying with these guys. But uh, I have a very unique uh, opportunity to watch uh, people's capabilities and people's tactics while I'm up there with orbiting. Like Bruce mentioned in 99, it was a very competitive year. You know, Tiger was leading that whole race till the last half of the last lap. And he blew up. And uh, it was pretty interesting to watch, you know, things like that. Or, or guys just flat miss a turn. You know, um, from the grandstands, when you're looking out, it, you don't understand the parallax. You know, somebody's got an inside track versus someone who's an outside track. The inside guy always looks like he's going faster when he comes to the pylon, you know, so you hear the announcer saying, oh, look, he just had a bunch of power and squirted it out ahead. When in reality, the guy flying, like Daryl mentioned, a smooth course, you know, is usually going 20, 30 miles an hour faster than the other guy. Um, so, yeah, through the years, I've had an opportunity to see some pretty amazing things. Uh, what impresses me the most, though, that, you know, those guys flying out there are really the best guys that you'd ever want to see fly. Some of the best pilots in the world out there race racing Reno. They don't get enough credit, you know. Not only are they uh, racing and flying fast, but you know they're operating a piece of machinery that isn't supposed to do that. And uh, you know, ninety percent of the time, they're operating very safe. So, what is your vantage point from circling up there? How high are you, and can you see everything that's going on? And when do you know? Unless somebody calls a mayday, that you know there, there's trouble. Can you sense that coming? Um, overhead, it kind of depends on the race. The real fast guys, I'll work more of it like 6,000 feet above the race course, and I try to stay at about 200 knots. You know, the T33 is a straight wing airplane and it's got good acceleration. And when somebody pitches up in an emergency, they're gonna they'll be at my altitude at about maybe 160 or 170 knots. So. I can cover the race course quick to get to them if they need me. Um, the slower races, I'll, I'll fly a little lower, a little slower. But uh, um, uh, you asked about can I sense something? Well, it, it's pretty hard. You know, we've got two people in the airplane, and then we always take someone who really, especially for the main event, somebody who understands the race planes and knows the planes. You try to keep track of everybody down there. Sometimes you can't even see them. You start counting shadows sometimes. Sometimes it's hard to tell who you're looking at, so we just count numbers and we talk a lot in the airplane. Um, there have been instances where somebody will pitch out with an emergency, but they don't call it, and um, it'll be up to us to determine if they need help. I usually don't say anything on the radio unless there's something really to say. But uh, all in all, it's, it's, it's pretty impressive to watch from above. I remember one year David Price was racing in David Red, and it looked like an F-16 going around there. He was going so fast, but he was so wide and so high. And I mean, he was like hanging on with two hands, I think. But uh, there was such a discrepancy in speed from the rest of the pack that I'll never forget that. And then there's always that uh, turn. Uh, for instance, one year, Steve-O started uh, in second position, which is, uh, you realize his whole racing career, he's never been number two on any map. That's pretty impressive, huh? 
<laughs> but uh, he started number two in his first year, uh, coming down the chute. He uh, rolled into the turn perfectly, and Will Whiteside missed the turn, and then Will Whiteside never saw him again. So uh, that's the kind of stuff you see from above. It may not be apparent from the grandstand, so I really get a kick out of watching you know, the techniques, you know, everybody's tactics. Well, it sounded like he learned very well that first year, you know, after the uh, the wave turbulence from uh, from Argonaut. Didn't, didn't want to deal with that at all. So get out in front, stay out in front, and uh, I think that's the uh, uh, the idea there. So, Steve-O, you spent a, a great deal of time working, you know, with the crew chief and the, and the race teams, you know, getting the plane ready. How do you think your intimate knowledge of uh, the airplane, the systems, the airframe, how does that transfer to sitting in the pilot seat and flying the course? How does that help you go faster, go smoother, and to, uh, to win the race? Uh, I think having an intimate knowledge of the airplane is, uh, from my standpoint, crucial to I wouldn't say winning the race, but uh, operating the equipment uh, most efficiently. Uh, there's so many different systems involved with the airplane, ABI systems, spray bar systems, uh, beyond the nuts and bolts of a P-51. And uh, having the knowledge to be able to fix a problem in, in flight or diagnose whether it's fixable or if you need to uh, you know, simply just pull the power off or uh, completely get out of the race. It just depends if you know how the system works. and. Uh, uh, for one, uh, one instance with Strago, we lost a uh, spray bar pump, and we have two different pumps and two different pressures. And uh, if I didn't understand how the system worked, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to continue the race. I would have figured, well, it's uh, the terminal. I have to end the flight. But knowing how the electrical system works on the airplane, you punch the circuit breaker back in, let it go for a couple more laps, and pop the breaker, push it back in. Uh, in that was a function of understanding what the pressure gauges were telling you and what the lights in the cockpit were telling you. It kind of, if you understand how it works, it's kind of like a, uh, it's a pattern that leads you to what the problem is. But if you don't have an understanding of the system, in my opinion, then you're lost and you'll either damage the equipment or uh, you know, something bad should happen. Uh, so, it, it, plus that's the best part of it to me, that the flying lasts eight minutes out there. That's pretty boring. You know, what about the rest of the year? So, uh, having the ability to, to work with people that have had uh, experience with the airplanes and learned about the airplanes. That, that's the best part of the whole thing, I think. And a lot of that's because of the people that are involved. You know, you look at this panel up here, and who wouldn't want to get a Christmas card from these guys? Um, <laughs> it's just great people, and that's what brings us back to Reno every year. So being able to work with the people, I've had the privilege of working with, uh, you know, Mike Nixon has done a tremendous job for Merlin's uh, LD Hughes, Tiger, uh, and then Bill Kirchenbaut, obviously, Mike Will. Everybody's just such a unique personality, but everybody brings something different to the table. Uh, and everybody has something to offer. And when I first started flying Strager, we did a lot of what we call hangar talking, where you, you come up with a scenario to fly the airplane, go out and do it, and then uh, get critique from Tiger or a couple of people. And you go out and try and do it better and learn what made them successful. And that's uh, from the get go, that's what, what I always try to do is who was successful at Reno and try and mimic them. Uh, I watched a lot of videos of Skip Holm flying Big O Red because uh, he to me flew the one of the best lines on the current course that I was going to fly on. Uh, so I religiously watched that night after night for a while show. Uh, you know, I picked up what Bruce was talking about, Tiger one head games, that was something. So you talk to Tiger about that. And it's, there's so many different facets to air racing. It's interesting learning from all these people involved. So speaking of that, you know, you spent a number of years with Tiger and you know, I, I assume that you know he, he taught you a lot, or you learned a lot working with him. Now that you're flying Voodoo, you know, do the head games go back the other side? And, you know, uh, what I learned about the head games were they don't work if you don't care. Uh, and that works to my advantage pretty well. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's funny because guys who are, are your friends throughout the year, you know, Matt Jackson, for instance, they talk to him on the phone quite a bit, run into each other and go to lunch. Uh, but when you get into that race mode, uh, you can really start screwing with people, and that's a lot of fun. Uh, especially when, in this year's case, Matt was flying straight. And, uh, you know, I've been working on the airplane for 10 years, and I keep meticulous notes on how everything works. And 
I remember he called me in uh, he called me in April first to say, "Hey, I'll be fine, Stray guy. I don't want to. Are we okay?" Like, yeah, absolutely. I, I can't wait to meet you, Matt. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so he started calling me. And how does the ADI system work on the airplane? And that I really don't remember. That didn't work pretty well. Well, you know, physically have to operate. So you start kind of start tapering interest there, and then just start not returning phone calls. And then it really, really starts messing with people. And then you show up to Reno, it's like, man, I thought we were friends. Are you still my friend? And they're worried about being a friend with you when you're, you know, you're up there to win. So it's uh, something that I learned, picked up from Tiger at LD. And uh, it was fun doing that with Strega and, and you know, uh, with Will, you can do that a lot. A couple other guys, they were just more susceptible to that because you know, they wouldn't be friends. And, uh, I'm not concerned about being friends that way. I want to beat you, so we got up from Tiger. Well, between you know Tiger and, and Bill Kirchenbach, you know there was there was always games going on, especially with Rare Bear in those days, because the the crews, while they would you know if somebody needed something, they would help them out, but you know once they hit the course, they were there to win, and I, I know that you know. Uh, a lot of that went on between both the, the crews uh, and the, uh, the pilots. Um, Clay, in, in the early days of the races, um, you know, talk a little bit about how some of that got established, some of the, the camaraderie um, in those first couple of years, because it was more about building the races themselves and getting them started. And talk a little bit about you know the fact that it, it really was kind of the wild, wild west because the, there hadn't been an air race in how many years? Twenty five. Twenty eight. Yeah. No, it's been what fifteen years. Yeah. Fifteen. <clears throat> well, the um, the first year of Reno, uh, the fastest airplane. Was probably Bardo or Darrow. Bardo was fast. They had a, a big engine and uh, uh, they had experience with uh, hydroplane boat racing with those engines. And they were the only one that had on a Merlin that had water injection. And uh, uh, Bob Love was flying the airplane. They went real fast and. Um, the reason that uh, he didn't win was the fact that he kept three pilots. His, his eyesight wasn't real good. And um, they had a system uh, that the first year, Bill Stead, also being a boat racer, they'd taken a system out of boat racing where you kind of build up points from the heat races. And uh, so, uh, Anyway, um, I, my guess is, and I'm not sure, Daryl can straighten me out, I'm sure, but I would think probably Daryl's airplane was uh, somewhat slower than uh, Bartol. And um, then uh, Marv, flying a straight Bearcat, it went pretty good. And there was another Bearcat, Walt Allred. Um, and uh, I, uh, I didn't know uh, too much about how much the engine would take. We are, I didn't have the water, around 70, or about 70 inches. And uh, the uh, camaraderie, the, the thing you're talking about, I, I think the guy, the guy that would need the most about uh, uh, playing on other people's uh, most of it was Chuck Lifer, he owned Bardo, and he'd been in uh, boat racing a lot, and uh, he would be uh, putting up rumors and things about what was going on, and it made it interesting, made it fun. Uh, but uh, I would say that everybody, there were friends, particularly after the race, we all uh, got to know each other quite well. And, I uh, had a few, uh, say, uh, reasons to get together during the year, social events, or to uh, talk about changing the, the rules, and uh, everybody was friendly. 
for the most part, the group of racers those first few years at Reno were pretty new to racing. There were only a, a couple that had come from, from Cleveland, correct? No one. No one came from Cleveland. I don't so, think at the first race at Reno 64, anyone climbed had ever seen an air race. So how did you get around the course the first time, and who did you call to, to ask questions about, you know, what do I do? Well, just staying on the outside of those pylons, I guess, and trying to fly as close to them as you can. It was, uh, everybody was in the same boat there that nobody had really raced before. And uh, uh, so uh, we were at the, uh, as Darren mentioned, that uh, Sky Ranch Airport, which was a dirt strip, probably about, I don't know, 3,500 feet long or so. And they had the race course running east and west across the highway. Uh, and they must have stopped traffic, I don't remember, but you flew right across the highway. And the, the, uh, and the grandstands and things, uh, they had grandstands, quite a few were to the west of the highway, facing north. So the course was north of the grandstand. Um, but what was really fun of the, the first year there uh, was the FAA would come out from downtown. Because the FAA would oversee the races? Well, they weren't overseeing the races in particular, but they were uh, trying to check airplanes that, you know, they had proper registration, same old deal, you know, the paperwork, and uh, there wasn't much of it then, but they were trying to build it up if they could. But anyway, they would, uh, they got off at 4.30, so they'd leave at 4 to get back to the office. Well, that's when the fun began. <laughs> as soon as the FA hit the road, everybody started flying each other's airplanes and doing things and having a, a good time. Not only just the race planes, the other uh, the little aerobatic airplanes. So it was almost a secondary air show after, after 4 o'clock until uh, sunset. Oh, it really was, yeah. yeah. Uh, I remember one evening there, Bob Hooper, flew everybody else's airplane, aerobatic airplane. And um, he got in, um, it was a fellow's name from Oklahoma, the, the first guy to do a lump walk in this country, I think. Uh, who? No, I can't think of his name anyway, Bob. Uh, would watch him fly, and he knew how long it would run upside down and all that. And um, so, so he took off, and the guy had a pit. And, um, you know, Bob was in the air two feet and climbing and rolling at the same time and ended up upside down, you know, 15 feet. He started, you know, climbing out inverted and then doing slow worlds climbing out. He didn't do the lunch tomorrow because there uh, were too many outside maneuvers, but uh, it was interesting. He just got each airplane to steer run. Um, and, um, oh, the, I think the Buker and different airplanes. But, like I said, that's when the fun began, uh, and everyone that was there, uh, the race pilots and everyone associated with it, was, went there to have fun, you know, and loved aviation, and it was, uh, that was a good time. Yeah, that was actually back in the days that, that uh, it was covered on television, and they had some, uh, some fairly decent uh, prize money between the, uh, the networks and the, the casinos. Yeah, they had, uh, the casinos actually kind of sponsored some of the airplanes, and uh, uh, the casinos love the races. It would bring a lot of people to town. Well, I think they still do. Yeah. We've uh, you had mentioned Chuck Lifeford earlier, Daryl. You and, and Chuck were very very competitive in those early years, and you've got a great story about Chuck playing a few, let's call them mind games with you in those early days about telling you that, you know, he was going to win and he had a secret weapon. And, you know, you kind of got that first-hand viewing. Uh, was that in 65 or 66? I forget what year it was. It was the, the first year that we uh, flew at Stead Air Force Base. And... Uh, 66. 66? Okay. What happened was uh, uh, 
Bob Love had flown Chuck's airplane, I think a couple of years before this, but now it was time for Chuck to fly it. And he came up to me in the tents one day and he said, uh, I'm going to, and I had the pole position and he was on my right wing for the race. He was second qualifier and he said, uh, when the race starts, I can push this button in my cockpit and gain a thousand horsepower. And I just turn on the nitrous oxide and I said, oh. And so at any rate, we came down to the start of the race and I looked out at Chuck on the right and he looked at me and went like this, <laughs> waved at me and then apparently pushed the button and the airplane zoomed ahead and then boom. <laughs> Luckily, I missed all the cowling that was flying by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I was thinking about that. Chuck uh, had never finished a race. Uh, his theory was he may have finished one, but he never, never, he never finished them. Uh, he flew about three years, I think, himself. And his theory was he was either going to win or he was going to break. And, uh, that uh, <coughs> race that Bill was talking about, <coughs> when he hit the nitrous, he made it around the first turn. I mean, it not fair and he hit it. But I was in good position to see him when it really started coming apart <laughs> and the uh, smoke and everything. And I said to Professor Ray, I said, uh, hey, Chuck, you just blew up. And he says, yeah, I know. He said, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> He had uh, two holes in the engine, you could look through the engine and put the cowling off to see if you could clear through the engine. Uh, but uh, you're right, he was definitely competitive. And uh, by the way, I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, he's still competitive. Uh, he and his wife went down to Argentina here about three months ago. They had some car race that was a reenactment of a car race in their 30s. And uh, he took that car. With, with vintage cars. Yeah, vintage cars, right. Uh, they had Rolls Royces, Bentleys, all kind of cars. Well, uh, let's see, what's got? Uh, Foggio or. Foggio. Yeah. He had driven a coupe car. Uh, I think it was made out of a Chevrolet or something. And uh, then two or three of them liked it. Well, Joe Clark, his good friend of Chuck's, he bought a car here about two years ago. It had all the stickers on it. He thought it was a replica of his car that won. And it wasn't at all. But Chuck indicated he'd like to go down and run this race. So Joe gave him the car. They uh, tore it down. It was just a piece of junk. Uh, I mean, terrible. Well, anyway, um, uh, Chuck Lockett's son's a fabulous machinist and everything. They totally rebuilt the car. And they went down, they thought it was going to be a social deal, uh, which everybody, they, everybody said it would be it. They'd lay overnight and have a good dinner and have a few drinks and everything. Well, on the first day, uh, he, he realized that there was another car, or two or three other cars, really racing. So he stayed with it. The first day he won, the, the first day, by. Uh, one, two. He, uh, the, the first day he, he won the race by one minute. And uh, so the next day it was the same thing. They kept going. They, they raced for 12 days, over 4,000 miles, went over Mountain Pass, 11,000 feet, went uh, way down by um, oh, the, almost the tip, uh, and uh, we got into snow at one point. And after 10 days, he won overall with this old car that, uh, by two minutes. And, and uh, 10 days is unbelievable, you know? And uh, so he's still competitive. <laughs> well, and, and we were actually hoping to have Chuck here today, but um, he called about two weeks ago and says, that I don't know if he was racing or doing something else, but he, he said, I, I'm actually going to be out of state and not able to attend. But yeah, Chuck, Chuck always uh, has some, uh, some good stories to, uh, to tell for that. So. 
and, and that's the, that's one of the better ones. And and you're right. He is either going to win or you know he's going to blow the airplane up. Uh, <laughs> but you know he's going to have a good time doing it. Steve, um, with the fastest speeds, you know, today, talk about you know how do you incorporate the the join up and the release because it's a lot different than when Bob Hoover was doing it with Old Yeller um, in kind of a stock Mustang because you know today uh, you know when they power up you know they're already on distancing that between the, the clean lines of the airframe and, and the engines. Well, yeah, where the T-33 came into play was in uh, 90, 1990, I think, in Reno. Yeah. Um, uh, Hoover's airplane had uh, just really kind of wasn't cutting it. Um, for instance, like in, in my day, you know, we'd be coming down the chute like in the uh, Super Corsair. Tsunami was the latest hot racer that I flew. When, when Hoover would say, gentlemen, you've got a race, I've got about 27 inches of manifold pressure. And literally, you're, you're almost at idle coming downhill and uh, indicating 400 miles an hour or whatever. So we tried the T-33. We've been hoping to be able to do that. Um, and now I come down the chute and uh, I could be running 98% on the uh, T-33 indicating 400 knots. And uh, Steve-O's next to me kind of nudging me, come on, let's go, let's go. <laughs> so that's how far we've come with the pace plane. But uh, yeah, the, the pace plane, had, you know, um, we fly different profiles for the different races. You know, the, the bronze, silver, and gold all have different requirements for different speeds and different levels of uh, pilot ability. Um, take, for instance, the gold. You know, we'll take off and uh, I'll, I'll hold about 180 knots and maybe 700 foot a minute rate of climb, something like that, until, uh, you know, get two or three guys on board and the wing. And usually the, you know, the pole and the next Two guys are pretty good and they'll get in there pretty quick and then we'll speed it up to 200 knots and then we'll be maybe 240 knots on the downwind. Now, this is pretty fast for a prop airplane, so, uh, you know, the, the real racers are not having any trouble and if there happens to be a, uh, a silver racer bumped into the gold, you know, he's going to be out there whipping that thing all the way around the course, but it all boils around the join up. It all boils down to uh, getting everybody in a good position so nobody has an unfair advantage at the start of the race. You know, I'll come, I'll come out of about 4,000 feet above ground level with a T-33. And here again, I, I know all the guys, how they fly and their abilities, so I can tell uh, coming down the chute, you know, if somebody's lagging a little bit, it might be because he's near full power or, or it's not because of his ability. There's been a lot of times I'll see Dreadnought back out of the formation, but I know Brian and Dennis are great pilots, so they're obviously at full throttle coming down the chute, so I might hold off a little bit from there, but uh, I think that's one of the reasons our, our race speeds have been higher too, obviously, because when I let them go, um, you know, we're indicating sometimes near 400 knots, and but they accelerate uh, past that speed. You know, their first, uh, the speeds after the first lap are even faster than the, <clears throat> the very first lap, you know. But uh, it's pretty exciting. For me too, it's really exciting. How is that different than, you know, when you were flying the Red Baron or the Corsair? Well, like I said earlier, you know, uh, flying with, with Bob's airplane, you know, we were such low power and, and to get a, a race engine from a low power setting up to race power, um, that might be another reason our uh, engines are lasting better these days as well. To go from almost idle up to full power in a short period of time, you know, the engine's got to go through a, a quite a shock, and uh, you could be you could baby that engine to get it up there, obviously. But uh, when, when somebody zooms right by you, you know, that's a disadvantage. You know, trying to trying to get to speed quickly is what's important. You know, uh, try to cut all the uh, disadvantages out. Of, uh, you know, sort of these on an even keel. That's where the T33 comes in really good. Pete. Um, this is a little off topic for racing, but, you know, Germany, more to uh, what you're doing. You're a member of a uh, very elite group called the Roadrunners. 
Talk a little bit about that. Well, the Roadrunners is an organization that the people who used to work at the test site up in Nevada, or who flew A-12s, or U-2s, or YF-12s, or SR-71s, or anything else that happened up at the test site, mainly the SR and the U-2, they are called the Roadrunners because the little birds, the little Roadrunner things, uh, I guess were up there at the test site, so everybody called the people that worked up there, including just the mechanics. Anybody that has worked on any of these airplanes can become a Roadrunner. And I was at the test site on three different, in three different decades, on three different programs. But the Roadrunners, and well, I was there on the A-12 program, and I was up there on another program called uh, Senior High, which was a little drone that we dropped off of the C-130. And then I was up there in another decade in the 70s on the uh, F-117. But only the guys who worked on the A-12s or the U-2s are from the Roadrunner organization. And every other year we have a big meeting, a reunion up in Las Vegas. And it's quite an interesting group of people. And Daryl, you would love the Roadrunner groups, because a lot of those customer test pilots, the guys are actually the customer pilots that flew the U U-2s and the A-12s, they still come, and one by one they're dropping off. But uh, the Roadrunners is a wonderful organization. And there was a book put out by a lady who wrote a book on Area 51, and they, Roadrunners group, had a chance to be interviewed in great detail about all the things that went on at the test site, and the lady went a little bit overboard on some things that uh, didn't make those guys very happy about what the book was about. And uh, they still aren't very happy about, the, about what they, they were, they didn't know she was going to be writing those interesting other things in the book. And uh, A little too much detail on Area 51? Well, there was details of things we didn't know, but we're not exactly sure that, that she took advantage of us because people did know about this stuff, to put her thoughts on things that we didn't know about, and, and the guys were kind of disappointed that they were taken advantage of. But the Roadrunners is a, a really good group of people, uh, and uh, I, we see quite a few of the old, the old guys on the crews, the old guys that were in the back seats of the uh, SR-71, uh, SR uh, that had flown A-12s, and uh, it was a real group. People, a lot of fun. Bruce, getting back to uh, to racing a little bit, let's talk a, a bit about the different engine combinations that you tried out on Dago. Because as crew chief and as pilot, you did a lot of experimentation with different combinations, additions, deletions to the airframe to really make it go fast. And I, I think. You know, if I remember correctly, Strega, Dago, um, Genie, and Voodoo were all kind of, you know, they all came out of the same mold um, and, and built by the same group of people, but each one kind of had a unique stamp, you know, to make it go faster. Well, we have to go back to 82 when Mike Nixon and Bruce Bolin and Pete Law here, you know, worked on the concept of building up Dago Red. And, some combinations that were special at the time on the motor. We basically ran a Dash 9 Merlin with transport heads and a, a Dash 9 supercharger. Had stock Allison rods and the unique features besides the cooling systems that Pete had talked about that were incorporated in the airplane were um, Mike came up with a uh, probably a Bruce's behest came up with a different nose case gear ratio that was uh, unique to that airplane at the time. Normally a Mustang Merlin would run a propeller to engine gear ratio of 0.79 to 1, and the transport motors were on 0.42 to 1. The objective is to spin the uh, engine higher, make more manifold pressure in the supercharger, and your ability then to keep the prop tip speed below supersonic. You want the prop to run around 400 or 1425 to 1450 RPM, somewhere near the standard Mustang prop. Well, Mike's idea uh, was to have Seattle Boat Works had built uh, gears up, Seattle Gear Works, I think it was, build a set of three nose gauge gears. And so that was the first time that Ron Headley operated the airplane and successfully won at Reno. Uh, when Alan acquired the airplane later on, there was a lot of teething problems with that combination. When I started flying the airplane, it had some terrible harmonics. 
at about 3,600 that would shake through the airplane and we were losing lots of, breaking lots of parts and cracking cases. And plus the nose, as we started to make more horsepower, the gear, the lower pinion gear was so small that it couldn't take the load without wearing the gears out and it would start howling. I think Strait had continued with that thought process and then Dwight, I think, went another direction using the Allison rod motor. So for a number of years that was the combination and as we ran out of speed, we, were, we seemed to run around 445 or so on the old long course, that was about as best we could do. At the time, I was racing Formula One airplanes with Ray Cody along with Alan, and when I was hired by David, I took that knowledge from Formula One racing, and we incorporated that back into, let me back up a second, David Price was the owner of the Museum of Flying, director of the Museum of Flying, founder, and was the owner of Dago Red, so he hired me on to do, continue the development work. When we got, uh, basically the combination was then, how can we beat Strega? And it, it, First, we wanted to beat uh, Dreadnought, so we figured if we can go 450 and, and hold 450 around the race, we may be able to beat them. So we were limited on horsepower at the time with Mike's combination of motors, and elected to, I elected to start a program where we looked at the airplane as if it was a Formula One. Where can we find a half a mile an hour everywhere in the airplane? So we took the airplane back apart, went through it, uh, and uh, went to Reno in 95 with a lot of new combinations. We had a 500 horsepower nitrous charge, we had roller rocker arms, we had electronic ignition, and, and, uh, and a new airframe, the new scoop on it. And the engine didn't work. Uh, we had done too many things, so we backed back off for 96, and uh, David went out, I believe I've got the time frame right, and with the original engine combination with 420 gears, we went 462. So we, we felt we picked up about 12 to 14 miles an hour in the airframe. We were still slower than Strega and still slower than um, Rare Bear. And so I went and talked with uh, Bill Stephanie and with Kurt or with uh, White Thorn to see if we could buy a mouse motor. And so the combination forward from there was. We went back and we ran an engine that incorporated Allison connecting rods. The rods were, were beefier but softer in material, so the engine could be at the point of almost detonating and the rods would uh, absorb that load without beating the oil film out. Um, we ran a 23, a 23 supercharger, which comes out of a P82, a very rare system that allowed us to make a little more boost. When the whole thing was said and done, you know, of all the engine combinations, David went out in 96, I believe, and qualified at 490, about 490 and change. I think uh, one or two uh, tenths slower than Rare Bear, but we felt we had uh, another 250 horsepower in the motor because we hadn't de-riched it yet, and we also had, uh, we qualified at 3,400 RPM and 120 inches. Rare Bear, we felt it qualified full throttle, so we always felt like we had, at that time in 96, an airplane that was capable of going over 500 miles an hour, although we never used the power at that time. Um, the airplane now is, you know, as it ran when Skip raced, it was pretty much all the same as far as its engine power plant combination. You know, there were some tweaks done here and there, some thrust line on the airplane and stuff, and it's still, I believe, uh, probably one of the fastest, if not the fastest, airplane out there. Although I think Strega, Mike's motor in Strega now makes more horsepower than we did at the time. Um, I still feel that there's some things in Dago Red that still make it the fastest, mainly in the cooling system. Uh, the out exterior of the scoop has less drag and some things that are done to the airframe, which I've given Steve all my notes since I don't do that anymore. He can carry that forward. <laughs> And, and that actually makes a good transition because that's where I was going next with the, the question. Uh, last year, uh, after four wins in Strega, um, you moved to Voodoo for 2013 for last year. Uh, oh, they, I think they, uh, yeah, they got new batteries. You got new batteries, correct? Yeah. We're good to go. Um, and. You made Voodoo a winner for the first time in its history um, in, in for unlimited gold. Rob Hanna tried, Will Whiteside tried, and you know, over the years, Voodoo always, you know, it came close, but you know, something you know went wrong. 
Bob Button in 2012 had decided he wasn't going to race anymore, Voodoo was out. How did you go to Bob and make the transition, get him, you know, flying Voodoo again? And, you know, what did you do to, to, to win the race? Uh, well, actually, I, I didn't go to Bob. Uh, I had decided after 2012 I'd go to like sailboat racing or something a little more. Which is just me with God. <laughs> right, no wind, no go. Um, anyway, so Bob called me in about April and said that he'd been tinkering with the thought of racing Voodoo, uh, taking it back for the 50th, the one year type of deal. Uh, you know, he'd achieved a lot of other stuff in his life and winning Reno he had still not achieved in 18 years. Um, so I met with him and then in April we decided. Collectively, he said, "We're not going to go to Rio without you." And I was, I wasn't going to go with anybody else, so I uh, decided to go ahead. And uh, to say that, uh, you know, just changing the pilot, make the airplane winner is an oversimplification. Uh, I think, like all these guys have touched on here, uh, to say it really takes a whole group of talented individuals uh, to come together and form a team. And uh, you know, we did a lot of work in, on the airplane beginning in April of last year, all the way up through September. And there was a lot of things uh, I didn't like with the airplane, things that I had learned from Strega that uh, I brought over, or talking with Bruce and stuff that did with David Red, and, uh, trying to make the airplane uh, a better better performer. Uh, unfortunately, I never got an opportunity to fly a Voodoo before we started working on it. So I had seen studied photographs and looking at trends that the airplane was showing, things to fix. So I was kind of going with that. Uh, but really, again, it was the whole group of individuals. Uh, and, you know, we had four guys working on it full time pretty much since April. Mike Wilton and his son overhauled two engines in about two and a half months. They were just going going nuts with them. So it was a, a group effort, and that was a great thing working with Bobby. He was so passionate about the races. Uh, you know, it was always 110% support, which made it easy working on the airplane. Uh, it's a fun environment to work in. All the guys were excited. Uh, a few of them had won before, but most of the group had again been trying for 18 years. Uh, and then, of course, after we ended up winning this year, now there's a, a renewed veer to keep on racing. So we started working on it two weeks after the races this year. And uh, you know, it's, it's just fun to see how that fire gets lit in people and the enthusiasm grows. Yeah, I, I, I was actually going to ask part two of the, uh, the question and, and say, you know, will we see Voodoo this year? At Reno, and will you be flying it? That's the that's the plan right now. Yeah, we're uh, we'll be there. It, it, because it, it, it's funny, I, I you know I've worked with Bob over the years, and I don't think I've ever seen him smile as big as he did when when you won last year. He was just he was so proud of that. And as you said, after you know everything he'd been through after 18 years trying to win that. And everything came together with, you know, the airframe and the pilots and the crew, you know, really, it was a really tight team. Yeah. I think the biggest thing was getting his wife off his back. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you doing this 18 years and you haven't won yet? You're crazy. And then finally it wins and pays off and now she's a happy camper too, so it makes it easy to go ahead. So that he can come back again, so that, that's a good thing. Clay, I want to switch it up um, with you because we are, you know, let's call it in Hollywood. One of the things that, that you've done for the community of aviation is to really bring the craft of cinematography um, together with aviation. Um, you started that, the air-to-air -air business, um, for commercial work, photos. How did you get started on, on that side of the business? Well, when the layer was new, I was um, a manager of sales. And I of Western State, 1964 and five, and that period of time period, and uh, I offered Douglas a free photo job. They were using a B-25, which was great, uh, be able to shoot without any glass. But when they would peel it off, like a DC-8, taking 20 minutes to get back in position again, and uh, so when the Douglas guys saw how fast I, I could reposition and things. Boy, they were real interested. They built a, uh, a camera mount that pivoted up by the window. But then uh, we built a, a door, a uh, lower part of the door on the rear that had a, a big window in the front. But it was in, uh, and I was doing my, uh, photography from 66 to, uh, say, 75, uh, almost every airline. 
But then in 75, was, uh, a couple of English guys had a company, uh, Continental Camera Service, or, uh, Continental Camera Systems, and uh, one of the cameramen was, uh, had been flying the B-25, not Planes of Fame, but uh, a Talman's B-25, and they, they had a prop runaway up at uh, uh, Boeing Field, and they landed across the runways and things, and he got out and said, I'll never go for one again. <laughs> you know? And he came back to see me and he said, isn't there some way we could put a periscope in or something? Uh, and he had worked on a movie, uh, you know, the Formula One movie, where they had remote cameras. So anyway, uh, these English people developed this periscope system. We call AstroVision, and it really revolutionized aerial photography because it would uh, rotate 360 degrees, one out the bottom, one out the top, and a mirror tilted. And so that uh, that really changed things. And, uh, we continue to do almost every line commercial, probably been to Europe 20 times or more for airlines over there uh, in Japan, but most of it done in this country when the planes were delivered new. Out in uh, Long Beach or Seattle, and, but I shot Top Gun, uh, Flight of the Intruder, the Great Santini, uh, and uh, all out of the Lear. What? All, all from the Lear. Yeah, all from the Lear. Yeah, yeah. The Lear was uh, the only civilian airplane that was to say fast enough and real maneuverable to uh, be able to work with fighters and things. B-70, yeah. Well, I didn't have the system. We were shooting out the window with the B-70. Darrell brought up something. It was a bad day. I was filming um, the XB-70 with four other General Electric powered airplanes, five. And uh, when we they had a matter of collision, uh, uh, Joe Walker, he was the chief NASA test pilot at the time, was flying a 104. And right at the end, we just finished, and I just told them, uh, I pulled out, I'd just been running behind the tailpipe, and the last of the B-70, I pulled back and revealed the five airplanes. And I told them that was it, we were finished, we have been uh, about an hour and 20 minutes. And just at that time, my, the horizontal stabilizer on uh, Joe Walker's airplane touched the wing tip was drooped 22 degrees, or 28 degrees, and it attached and it rolled up over the top, knocked both vertical fins off. And, uh, you know, and it flew for 25 seconds, it looked like it was going to fly, and then it got, and uh, Al White said, I, I knew something was wrong, he, he said, I had a yaw damper. <laughs> he tried to run her, and that didn't work, and then it just went straight up. Start tumbling in the brand. I guess uh, I read somewhere it's still the most expensive crash in the history of aviation, um, as far as the equipment. But anyway, other than that, we've had a hundred percent safety record, <laughs> and I had nothing to do with that, of course. Um, but uh, getting back to air in just a moment, you know when. Um, when I won in 1970, I had the second fastest airplane. And Who was the first? What? Who was the first? Daryl. And um, Daryl take off, and I think, didn't you have an air bottle to blow the gear up or to bring the gear up? And it didn't get all the way up, hanging down one, one gear, so uh, he kept going, and, uh, and I re remember I, I had so many, uh, time I ever laughed there, it was the only time I ever, ever was uh, ahead of it. And uh, you know, when I came up and when I was going to laugh and I gave her saying that, I felt, I, I felt sorry that Tuesday had that kind of a problem and everything. And I thought, you know, it's probably good for him to see the other airplanes in the race, you know, that uh, <laughs> other than seeing him on a ranch, he didn't know who was there, he was there, he was always out ahead. You know? and, uh, but anyway, I was second fastest, but the first fastest had problems, so. And, and Daryl, do you want to follow on with, uh, you know, 
how the rest of that race was? Was it a, a different viewpoint than you were used to? Because, you know, you were winning an awful lot at that time. He looked like Bob Gilbert. I can't remember. <laughs> so let's talk about Shockwave, since you can't remember that one. Tell us a little bit about where the airplane is today, what your goals are, and what you'd like to see it achieve. Well, Shockwave came about a good many years ago, or started a good many years ago. What air racing has done is the, the fast airplanes are running up against the shock limit. What happens is the, you get up to a certain speed, the shock wave will form on the ailerons or the elevators, and the airplane becomes unstable. And uh, what happened, uh, they changed the way they measure the speed on the course. It used to be you, they'd measure from pylon to pylon to pylon, even though you can't technically fly pylon to pylon to pylon, you have to sweep around the outside, but the speed was measured from pylon to pylon. Well, uh, some years back, they made an adjustment on the speed, and that was so that the, the speed of the race would appear faster. The airplanes don't go a lot faster, but their time and the timing indicates that they are faster. Well, anyway, I came up with the idea um, with Bruce Bowen and Pete Law to uh, build an airplane that would uh, fly under the shock wave, uh, the shock limit, and you could keep going. And what it is, it's a hydraulic flight control system will solve that. I remember years ago when I first started flying the F-86A, it had a hydraulic boosted system, but it was not a hydraulic flight control. And part of the curriculum when you start flying it was to fly to 45,000 feet, roll over, go straight down, and go supersonic. Well, you're sitting there with a stick like this, shaking all over the place. But the later airplanes that had the, the flight controls locked, and basically what you're doing is you're moving the stick, is moving the hydraulic valve so that it, it doesn't feed back through the, to the stick. Well. We came up with this idea of putting a, uh, a large engine in a uh, home-built airplane and uh, put an F-86 flight control system in it so it was uh, hydraulic lock. And uh, we put a 4360 in it and uh, people ask me, why do you use a 4360? And I said, because they don't make an 8620. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, the fuselage is homemade, the tail's F-86, uh, the, the outer portion of the wing is, uh, the folded pars portion of the, uh, what is it? C theory. C theory. This is, uh, the airplane was designed by Bruce Bowen completely, and, uh, uh, we started building it years ago, and after I had my calamity up in Greenland, I ran out of money and uh, parked it. And so the airplane is parked in a uh, hangar, I call it a barn, up in Mariposa, ready to be finished. So you're still looking for potential uh, uh, either, sponsorships to... Either sponsorship or purchase. Uh, I'm getting to be so old that I, I don't fly anymore. And, uh, maybe it's time to move on and let someone else finish it. So there's an opportunity uh, if you'd like it. Talk to, uh, to Daryl after the, uh, the event. Pete, um, talk about your part in setting records with the Red Baron and the Griffon engine and then the one with uh, Daryl and uh, the Pratt uh, Whitney. Yeah, well, when Daryl uh, enticed Bruce and I to come into air racing, the object was to air race, but I think Daryl always had in mind that we wanted to beat, that he wanted to beat the Germans' 469 mile an hour record. 
and it ended up to come to pass uh, with an awful lot of work. And the uh, Daryl had more to do with that than anybody else. He worked on the airplane, did the engines, did everything, and then Bruce and I were just there to do engineering. And when Daryl decided that um, that Bruce and I needed to go help other people uh, so that air races could continue on and uh, other people would have fast airplanes. Eventually, uh, Bruce and I went and did some work for Cliff Cummins, Candace, and, uh, and eventually uh, the Red Baron P-51 with the Griffin engine, which Steve got to fly, and Darrell got to set a speed record at Reno one year by winning the gold in the Red Baron. And uh, then Steve flew the airplane for the world speed record, and that was an exciting affair because nobody had ever put a Griffin engine into a P-51. The Griffin engine had been in Spitfires, which was what it was designed for, and also in the Shackleton bomber, they had the uh, uh, um, unaft-cooled uh, Griffin 50, 57 and 58. And we took a combination, well, actually Steve at the museum, they had a Spitfire, and they had the Griffin uh, engine, I think it was a 65. And we, Bruce did some research and found out that we could make the supercharger of a Dash 75, no, the Dash 64, with the, with the uh, case of the, uh, of the Shackleton, because it had the counter-rotating propellers, and then we could still use the crankshaft from the 64. Yeah. Oh, anyway, we did all the engineering. We built a down a downdraft type, I mean, a, a updraft type type system. No, actually, it was a, no a downdraft system, so we could take the scoop on the top instead of the bottom of the P51, and uh, we put a carburetor from an R2800, which is what we had become used to on Daryl's airplane. Used a water injection system from the from the R2800 engine mounted it remotely. Did a whole lot of work on that project and ended up setting the world speed record at 499. And unfortunately, we went up to uh, Tonopah at the hottest part of the year because the, uh, the hotter the air is, the less dense it is. And the shock wave that, I mean, that uh, Daryl was talking about, doesn't, you can go faster with the airplane uh, because the density before the shock wave starts to form on the top of the wing and the top of the other surfaces. So we always try to set the speed records on the hottest days, which is why he went to Edwards for, for the Bearcat in 69. And uh, when, we, when, when Steve had to fly the airplane at uh, Tonopah, unfortunately, they had to get out there early in the morning real quick because it, the Air Force had sort of asked them that not be there on Monday, and uh, Sunday didn't make the record, and they wanted to go faster. So it was a about 60 degree day, and when when we were counting on a 110 degree day, I think Bruce had calculated that we could go 500 and 518 miles an hour with that airplane if the uh, temperature of the air had been like it was supposed to be up over 100. So. It, he ended up only going 499 miles per hour. And, uh, and then, of course, you know what happened to Reno in, in, uh, in September. And um, after that, Bruce and I sort of got helping some people who were working on Rare Bear uh, so that we could sort of help them with the 10 years later to go for their speed record, which still stands at 528. Which is very impressive for that. So, well, Shockwave is going to be able to go 600. And, and, uh, and I, I look forward to seeing that. Bruce, can I put you on the, uh, the, the spot here? Yeah. Who, in your opinion, are the two best pilots racing unlimited gold in Reno today? And what are we going to see this year? Well, that's a, a good question. And yeah, it does put you on the spot a little bit. But first, let's quantify what a good pilot is. So, and I mean, there's guys out there that are great bending the airplane perfectly around the stick. There's guys out there that have the ability to, you know, analyze work on the airplanes. There's pilots that are great with the, with the crowd, you know, and, and it's all about 
if we're talking about winning, then you know, Steve owes my vote because he brings a combination of all those things to the table, which you know is unusual, especially for a young man to come here to the end of the sport and have his charisma, his knowledge of the airplanes and his ability to fly, you know, and so I've done I, I'm not I don't fly anymore, so I've done everything I could to kind of hand what I had for information off to him. Second in choice um, is a difficult one because there's so many good pilots out there. You know, you've got Dennis and Brian Sanders still flying and um, Matt Jackson, you know. But as I look at one, if I was to vote for a second one in there, it would probably be Hoot Gibson. And then he's so good with people. He's, uh, I don't know that he works on the airplanes a lot, but he has a great understanding of aerodynamics. And, he, you know, it's been basically faster than any of us around here. You know, and he brings a space shuttle in it, so he knows to go, how to go fast around the race course. So that, that's who I choose. Good answer. Steve, I'm going to give uh, my last question to you, and then if we've got a couple minutes, we'll, we'll open up for a couple of audience questions. Where are we going to see future air races coming from, and what would your advice be to anybody who either wants to get into the aviation business or into the racing business? Thanks, those are the toughest questions. <laughs> The best for last. Well, uh, like you probably heard us talk about, uh, to be involved with airplanes, you have to be involved. And uh, I don't think any of us have been involved knowing where we're going. We just uh, got involved because it's what we love to do. We love the people we've been, uh, been associated with. And, you know, who knows what path you're going to end up on, you know, where it's going to take you. But uh, I don't think there's any set way to say how to become an air racer. But, uh, just got to get involved, like Steve said, as my son said earlier. <clears throat> you know, he, he saw Strega sitting there on the ramp. I got to get involved. I, definitely, I really like that airplane. And uh, who knows which way it's going to take you. Um, as far as uh, where the air racers are going, um, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's a good question. You know, every year they, uh, there's only one air race in you know, Reno. Every year it gets harder and harder, especially after the accident that, that uh, happened a few years back. You know, the expense of uh, running an event like that and, and uh, you know, faced with a bad year. One year the wind was blowing, they lost a little money there, then the accident, and then the recovery, you know. Uh, one, one big issue you have with an air race, you think, well, let's have an air race in uh, Colorado. Okay, um, we tried that. Let's try one in Texas. We tried that. There's something special about Reno, the, you know, the background mountains, the... Uh, Airspace is available. The, the airport is, a, is ideal for air racing. You know, overseas, there's three runways. And, and there's just not a lot of places you could hold an event. It's, uh, you know, Mojave was a great airport, but uh, you had no background really, you know, understand what the airplanes were doing, how fast they were going. And, and of course, it's down the middle of the desert. Where does everybody uh, go when they're not air racing? So, yeah. I'm really not sure what the future will bring. Uh, I just hope that Reno can hold it together. I think it's a very important event. It's the only event like it in the world. You can go to Reno, unlike any other air show, and you'll see people from all over the world there. It's, uh, it's, I think it's a great event, and I think it's inspired a lot of people through the years, so uh, I've just been glad to be a part of it. And tickets are up for sale on the website. Uh, the event dates are there, and hopefully we'll see everybody there in September. Harry, do we have time for a couple of questions? Do we have questions in the audience? Hang on, I will. Uh, oh, you going to take it out there? Good. May I ask this? Uh, I'm concerned about uh, the last accident as to, as to whether the shortening of the airfoil or shortening of the modifying the uh, ailerons uh, to create a, a higher uh, stall speed, high speed stall. Would, uh, the question is as to whether uh, there should be limitations so that the, the aircraft won't, uh, won't stall so quickly. Uh, that's my question. Well, you know, the ailerons weren't the problem with that uh, accident. The accident, you know, you, know could, you could point a finger at a lot of things, but uh, you know, airplanes should be well flight tested before it ever gets on the race course, and that's really the bottom line of what that accident happened. That's probably the real reason that you know, it wasn't part of the flight test. And, and I think there were a lot of lessons learned from that as well. Um, 
Yeah, and then we'll get back. I think you all said that uh, on the race course you're running about 3,300 uh, RPM and pulling about 120 or so inches manifold pressure. What do you get on a standard stock uh, Merlin engine? You know, I, I can't believe that it's even half of that. Steve, you want to take that? Uh, the stock. Merlin engine was rated at uh, 61 inches at 3,000 RPM. Uh, and I think with water, the dash line was up to 67 inches. Go all the way back in the uh, center. Thank you. Um, the Griffin, uh, I thought was a really remarkable engine. And then uh, I saw the Arrow Shackleton's uh, landing all the time in the system. They seem to have a much bigger prop. But I didn't see anyone use the Napier engine. I was wondering why no one's interested in the Napiers. <laughs> Who wants to take that one? Oh, Bruce wants it. Well, with the Napier, first, there's uh, it's a very complex engine, being a 24 cylinder flat sleeve valve engine. Uh, they weren't very reliable at the time they were built. But the service life on them initially was about 10 hours. Um, sleeve valve engines typically don't uh, take well to a lot of boost because you can't transfer the heat out of the combustion chamber through the sleeve into the liner. And so I'm sure that the airplane was capable of making, or the engine was capable of making 24, 2500 horsepower, but that's about 1500 horsepower short. Plus it's a big frontal area. You have issues with a left hand rotating propeller. Uh, no propeller blades that really match that are, that are good airfoil section. I have one for Clay. Would he like to recall a event of the Mojave race, the California 1000, and the airplane that he and Al Paulson flew in that race? That's a great question. <laughs> well, the California 1000, it was uh, uh, 1970, the, the first one, that right there? So, and uh, that was the year I won uh, Reno, and so uh, I, I didn't have another engine for the P-51. And anyway, I'd always uh, just kind of thought jokingly, a DC-7 would go uh, pretty fast, and um, had a 310 knot red line. And um, so uh, Al Paulson had about three of them, and, and uh, I, did, I told him, well, we raced one of those, this Mojave 1000, so we picked the, the one that was supposed to be the best one, and the, uh, it had been flying, and the flight engineer was telling us it used quite a bit of oil on the number three <laughs> engine. And, um, I called uh, Heimendinger, um, Dan, Dan was just asking what uh, the weakest thing on the airplane was. I wasn't flying, I'm pulling over 2G. But he said it was the outboard um, engine to sell. And I told him what we are going to do, and he said, um, he kind of laughed, and he said, you know, the engine's going to get hot. You're going to have to open those cow, cow flaps up. And he said, it costs a lot of shaking, but don't be concerned about that. Well, I knew quite a bit about the seven. I instructed him in the United things, and I was aware of that. But anyway, uh, when we flew to Mojave, it was interesting. I figured out we'd flown them wrong all those years on the airlines because you couldn't warm them up. When you, when you went 310, there was so damn much air going through there that had to run about 150. And uh, you couldn't get the oil warm. Uh, and uh, so we started out. I, I, well, another screw up was my crew chief said, uh, How much fuel do you want? And I said, I'd like 5,000 gallons. Well, he tried to add 5,000, that topped it off. And uh, we were really heavy. I wanted to dump fuel in the first fire. <laughs> now, now I'm sure that's <laughs> it disqualifies. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, we did it, you know, just have for fun. And uh, uh, like we started out, I took Mito Power. Do a whole 350, but 
after an hour or so, we were just coming back to hold the speed, and uh, and I had a G meter, and when I went up to the ticket arena or to Mojave to try it, I was by myself, so I put the G meter on my side, and when we flew in the race, I flew in the right seat. You know, well, I couldn't see the G meter. Well, anyway, uh, finally after about 40 laps, 66 lap race or 45 laps, I said. Give me that G meter and they unscrewed it and set it on my side. And we started knocking off over 10 seconds a lap just because in a big airplane you have that feeling when you pull hard on the wheel you're doing something you really shouldn't do, but when you have a G meter in front of you, you just set it where you want it. So I, I was um, started knocking off um, 10 to 15 seconds a lap. And uh, if we'd had that from the very beginning, yeah, we might have won that race, which would have been a bad thing for air racing. I'm glad we didn't, didn't do that. But uh, uh, at the end, we were only, uh, I think, around three and a half minutes or something. And, uh, uh, Sherman Cooper uh, was number one, went nonstop. And uh, who else? Cliff, who was that? Cliff was number two. Cliff, Cliff I mean, he went nonstop. And uh, I don't remember who three was. There were about six fighters when I saw five, at least. It was Sanders' airplane, but there wasn't Sanders. Metcalf. 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 But anyway, we, we did it for, to have fun for last hour. I, I told him on the G meter, I, I told him, call on G's to turn, say I'll hit his camera, I'm taking pictures of other airplanes, you know, like at a G meter. <laughs> There's another part of that too, when Clay told me that story, and I said, you could indicate 310 knots with that thing? He goes, well, yeah, it's 12,000 horsepower, we know. <laughs> Did you surf lunch on that flight as well? <laughs> Uh, I guess I'm going to ask maybe questions that everybody already knows the answer to, but I don't. Uh, two questions back to back. Uh, the first one is, in your view, what has kept Reno Air Races from expanding, uh, you know, like NASCAR, you know, having more events and more locales? And then how do you, uh, or what do you think about um, the Red Bull Air Races in terms of comparison in that regard, even though I know there's a lot of different Steve, you want that one? <laughs> uh, I think uh, uh, when you look at NASCAR, they have great publicity, uh, great sponsors, and that's all due to television coverage. Everything stems from television coverage, in my opinion. And uh, you can't go anywhere without seeing a NASCAR advertisement somewhere. And, like, the races are covered very well. There's cameras in every car, there's cameras in the pits, you know, all of the boys, right? And Every one of us here can identify with driving a vehicle, so we know we can imagine what it would be like to drive a race car. The problem with the air races is, is that not every one of us can identify with flying an airplane, so you don't have that first person feel. Uh, the second part, the main issue, is that there is no television coverage. And that's the big, and I want to touch on that because everything stems, again, from the television coverage. It's hard to cover the air races when you have an eight and a half mile racetrack for the unlimiteds. How do you uh, capture an airplane going around the pylons that? really shows you they're going 500 miles an hour. I'm sure a lot of you have seen stuff on YouTube, uh, and you can see an airplane go over your head, but there's really no sense of speed. And Steve touched on that earlier. That's what is great about Reno with the background. When you can see an airplane moving across a mountain, you have a long shot, you can really get that sense of speed or lap of slower aircraft. So it's hard to capture on TV. Uh, but I think, ultimately, uh, the races would do better with television coverage, because now you can start attracting sponsorship. Uh, the first thing when you go to a big sponsor, the first question I'll ask you is, how much television coverage do you have? What are your numbers? And when you say none, they say, thank you, goodbye. Uh, so if there's television that leads to sponsorship, which leads to more money, it could lead to uh, more money for the teams or a bigger purse. But if there's a bigger purse and there's money in your sponsorship, you get teams interested or individuals interested in building airplanes that were finishing airplanes. Uh, and that would really help the sport to grow. So that's the number one thing in my opinion is television coverage and not, uh, it really needs to be thought out well and planned probably with uh, aerial coverage 
and helicopters or something with long shots, uh, pylon coverage, and get each team to get on board with having an in cockpit camera, uh, one that looks on your shoulders so that you could, you know, go from airpoint to airpoint, follow kind of something like NASCAR did. Uh, the second part to your question, what do we think of the air threadable air races? Uh, I can't speak for everybody else, but I don't think too much of them because it's a time trial. Yeah. It's not an air race. And uh, that is something unique to the air races in Reno is that it's head-to-head -head race like NASCAR. And while what they do with the Red Bull air races is it requires a lot of skill, I surely can't do that. Uh, very skilled pilots and there's a uh, similar level of uh, mental and physical uh, ability. It, it is just a time trial. Uh, so I, I don't consider it an air race. It's like the Red Bull air show. It's a spectator sport, but then again, they are so popular because of the television coverage. You know, everybody that I meet, oh, you air race? What's that Red Bull air race like? You know, the, the, all, the, all they know is the Red Bull air races, again, from the media exposure. And, and I think part of uh, what makes Reno unique is everybody that's up there is up there because they love the race and they love the camaraderie. And if you had that, you know, week in, week out, I don't know that you could do that because everybody has other jobs, other opportunities, other obligations, and I don't think can you can you come up with enough venues? You know how many NASCAR tracks are there? Can you come up with you know 25 or 30 or 40 you know different venues to do that and generate the crowd? I don't, I don't know that you, that you can do that. It'd be interesting. Um, 30 seconds. Final word. Um, I want to start down with uh, with Bruce and, and come this way. Uh, give me give me final thoughts on on air racing and um, what we're going to see at uh, or what what you would like to see at Reno this year. Well, first as a final thought, I'd like to thank you for putting this all together and gathering us all around here while my viewers and stuff. Um, as far as Reno this year, I, I know, you know, talking with Steve, um, he's going to have Voodoo there, and I've heard that uh, Strag is going to be there, Dago won't be there, Rare Bear, I don't know what its position is, so it should be a competitive race if they have a race, and I talked with Bill Leck uh, last week, and it looks like they're moving forward, he's the director of operations, so I'm, I'm hoping that we have a good race and everybody's competitive and safe out there. Where is Voodoo now? Uh, I'm sorry, where's Dago? It's uh, up in Fresno. Uh, one of my, one of the crew members of Dago Red uh, purchased it uh, when it was sitting over here in Chino, and he's got it basically up in his front room. And <laughs> he lives in his shop, and so the airplane's apart. He's been working on it. So it may show back up. It's not going to show up as a Tia, so don't worry. <laughs> I said at the very beginning that I think that the uh, the future of Reno depends upon what they decide on where the pilots are going to be forced to fly. They've moved the deadlines in, they have a high altitude, you can't go above it except in emergency conditions. And I think that the people who have to fly the race course realize that they're going out there and if somebody's in the way and they have to go up and pass them, so be it. If they get disqualified, they get disqualified. I don't think that's correct. I think they, somebody should realize that these airplanes are there to race. You don't have brakes to put on when they say, well, you just slow down. I mean, you can't just slow down. We're, they're built to go fast, low drag. You can't, and you're coming downhill from the back. It's very hard. I do hope there's racing. Obviously, I will engineer whatever needs to be engineered for as long as I live, because this is kind of in my blood from the days with Daryl starting back in, in 1964. And I want to thank you all for, for uh, coming to, to hear us babble on about airplanes and air racing. Thanks, Pete. I don't have a lot more to say, I'll just say ditto, but it's been a great ride for me all these years, and uh, you know, um, as a little kid, the first air race I went to to watch Clay Lacey, uh, and I did see Clay kind of wave at Daryl when he went by. Uh, I remember a lot of things about that, and uh, 
to work with Daryl that, that first year when he flew the Red Baron and uh, come a long way to where we are now. Um, who knows what the future will bring, but uh, and I can guarantee I'll be involved as much as I'm allowed to be involved. So it's, uh, I think like I said earlier, it's a great event and uh, a lot of great people involved. The original Reno races came about because of the casinos up there. It's always in the middle of September when the kids go back to school and the uh, crowd of people coming over to the casinos would fall off. So they came up with this idea of having the air races to bring the people in, and it worked. And the original days they had, uh, it was on Wide World of Sports. The award banquet was held at some casino downtown. And now it's held in a hangar at the airport, and uh, there's no wide world of sports. They need to get back to the old days. Well, I'd like to um, recognize, of course, everybody recognizes him, but Ed Maloney for getting this whole place started here. Uh, and kids, your sons, and uh, Steve, and, and uh, but this, where we're sitting here in this hangar, in this area, is really the heart of uh, so many things, including air racing. Uh, it's the heart of all kind of World War II planes or war planes, but the things that have gone on here, and uh, the things that Steve and now Young Steve and everything is into uh, has it made a indelible uh, impression in the survival of World War II airplanes. And thanks, Ed, for doing it. Steve, we save you for last because we hope that you're there. We look forward to seeing you in, in Voodoo. What are we going to see? Uh, the great thing with Rio is there's so much uh, innovation in uh, Formula One classes and sport classes, and, uh, and you know that there's a jet class now. There's so many different facets to air racing, and uh, all those classes are just as exciting and have just as many stories. This is obviously representative of just the unlimited division, but uh, that's going to be what's exciting at Rio is the growth of other divisions. Hopefully, the unlimited division will continue as well. Uh, that's a big draw for the crowd, but uh, you know, look at the other classes too. There's a lot of look in the four and one class, and they're so nitpicky about a tenth of a mile an hour. You know, it's really innovative with the stuff they come up with. So that's really what the excitement of Rio is: is all the people coming together, and it's uh, it's such a privilege to be associated with this group of uh, individuals. Uh, what an opportunity! I, I pinch myself all the time. I can't believe it's come true. It's been a dream of mine forever, and uh, just there's no guarantees. You don't take anything for granted. And I'm uh, glad that we're going to be back there another year and uh, look forward to sitting up here again in 50 years. And on that note, thank you all very much for coming. And for coming. Enjoy the day. Enjoy the day.